Okay, so uh, today we're raising the dead. Um, uh, we're not actually going to raise uh, dead people on stage here because I couldn't get a permit from the Board of Health. Um, so and if you were hoping for that and if you're disappointed, feel free to play Angry Birds on your iPhone uh, while I spend 15 minutes talking about something else. Uh, raising dead languages and uh, dead cultures uh, using linguistic methods. Um, so, we're going to start with the Romance languages. Uh, you all know what Romance languages are, French, Spanish, um, Italian, various others. Why are they called Romance languages? Again, you know this, it's not because they're romantic, although maybe they are. Ah, que belle, bellissima. Ah, mon amour, vous avez les yeux d'un poisson mort. Um, so, um, Maybe they work for romance, but the reason they're called romance languages, of course, is something we can see with data right here. So if we look at words meaning mother in Spanish, madre, uh, French, mère, Italian, madre, um, dos and de and due for two, diez and dies and dieci for ten, uh, you don't have to be particularly bright to look at these and say, well, golly gee, Maynard, them sure languages do look uh, similar to me. Okay, so they look similar to all of us. And we know why. It's because they are descended from the language of the Romans, hence Romance languages, uh, namely Latin. Um, what does that mean, that languages are descended from some other language? Again, I think you know what that means. It doesn't mean that Latin uh, ventured into a tavern in Gaul sometimes and met a Gallic speaker and nine months later French was born, right? <laughs> what it means is that all languages change over time and they develop dialects in different places. For example, you may notice that my dialect, although somewhat attenuated, is what we could call oh yeah, Minnesotan dialect. Um, so, um, probably different from your dialects. Uh, given enough time and political disunity and various other things like lack of television, uh, then these dialects might develop into different languages, which is what happened with Spanish, French, and Italian. Because again, all spoken languages change. So in this case, we know that the Romance languages are all descended from a single language, Latin, and Latin was written down uh, around 2,000 years ago, so we know exactly what the Latin words for mother two and 10 were. Okay, um, so we have the Romance language family and others that you have heard of, uh, the Germanic language family, including English, German, Dutch, uh, et cetera. Um, the Celtic language uh, family, Irish, Welsh, and some others. Uh, Slavic, I mean, what does it mean to be a Slav? It means that you speak a Slavic language, right? Russian or Serbo-Croatian or so on. Um, in India, all of these languages, not just in India, Urdu um, spoken in Pakistan um, and in India a little bit. Uh, Romani language of people sometimes called gypsies, uh, spoken all over the world. Uh, these Indic languages are descended from the ancient language Sanskrit. Um, the Iranian languages, not just in Iran, Farsi is modern Persian, uh, Kurdish, you know, Pashto, of course, in Afghanistan. Uh, there are some languages that don't have any close relatives. Uh, I can think of them as an only child. Um, I have nine brothers and sisters, so I feel sad for Greek. Uh, no, no brothers and sisters, must have been lonely growing up. Um, so we have these language families, and these are only some groupings that we can establish using the exact same uh, way that we just established the Romance language family. Um, these are some language families of Europe and Asia. Okay, well, what you might not realize, though, is if we take those language families and a few others, um, which I haven't put up here, and look at words for, let's say, mother, two, and ten uh, in these uh, language families, uh, we can, in fact, see some similarity. We'll take Latin for the uh, Romance Latin languages. Uh, ancient Greek, uh, mater, meaning mother, duo, deca, as in decagon, ten-sided figure. Sanskrit, ma, ta, dvao, desha. Um, Old Irish, spoken uh, over a thousand years ago in Ireland. Um, Russian, uh, mat, dva, desyat, uh, as the representative of Slavic languages. Once again, it does not take a genius to look at this data and say, hmm, those all look similar to me. Okay, so what do we make of that? Um, these languages must be descended from some ancestral language. Now let's think back to Romance for a minute. In the case of Romance, we know the ancestor language. The ancestor language uh, was Latin. In the case of Germanic, the Germanic tribes were not in fact literate uh, early in their uh, historical period. Uh, they were too busy running around the forest spearing moose and plotting to overthrow the Roman Empire to start writing things down. Um, nevertheless, there was a Germanic language, which is the ancestor of English, German, Dutch, etc., 
Um, German is not the ancestor of English. They're both descended from a common ancestor, same way that Spanish and French are descended from a common ancestor. Uh, when we don't know what the common ancestor was exactly because it wasn't written down, we give it a name like Proto-Germanic. That's the ancestral language for the Germanic languages. Uh, these languages or these groups are spoken all the way from uh, Europe, uh, all the way east as far as India. And so we might call those uh, language, uh, this language family Proto-Indo-European or P-I-E. Uh, don't call it Pi. Um, I don't know why, but no one calls it Pi. If you go up to a linguist and say, uh, I'm studying Pi, they'll say, what? If you say, I'm studying P-I-E, they'll say, oh, good for you. Um, <laughs> so um, I've put the words here. Now, again, this language uh, was never written down. These speakers of this language were completely illiterate. Um, but by using phonetic knowledge of various sorts and knowledge of how languages change, we can actually reconstruct the way that they pronounced these words. Um, so there's an H2 there. That means there's more than one different kind of H in the Proto-Indo-European language. This one was pronounced something like H. Um, so that word for mother was pronounced something like Mechter. And two is Duo and Ten is decum. Um, and I've put asterisks in front of them, not because I love asterisks, but to show that these are reconstructed languages or reconstructed words never written down. Um, so that's what the asterisk in front means. Okay, so there's our Proto Indo European language family, and it includes a wide range of languages uh, spoken uh, still today in uh, most of the languages of Europe, languages of Iran, languages of uh, India, northern India in particular. Um, a little side note. Um, Looking at this data, uh, you notice that the English word, uh, where English begins with a T, Latin is normally going to be, begin with a D and vice versa. What this means is that the Indo-European word started with a D and D turned into T in English. Um, and that shouldn't be too shocking for you if you say T, D. Go ahead and say it. It won't hurt you. T, D. Feel where the tongue is hitting the roof of your mouth when you do it. T, D. And you'll see those two sounds are very similar to each other. Um, Voltaire said a few hundred years ago that etymology is a science in which the consonants count for little and the vowels count for nothing. But, uh, that was true 200 years ago or 300 years ago, 250, I guess, probably when he said it. Um, it's not true anymore. Uh, nowadays, the consonants and the vowels count for everything. And so you have to be very careful. And the crucial thing here is that English T has to go along with Latin D unless there are certain other factors intervening. But English D will not be the same as Latin D. So we see this here beginning of the word. And this can allow us to find other words that come from the same ancestor, cognate words. Um, for example, the English word tame, the Latin word meaning tame is domo. And there's that TD correspondence. Uh, English eat and Latin edo. There's that TD correspondence, regularity of sound correspondence. What this also means is that the English word day is not cognate, not related to the Latin word dies or to its um, Spanish descendant dia. They are just accidental similarities um, because English d does not equal Latin d. Uh, English d equals uh, some, um, actually equals Latin f normally. Um, so uh, day and dies are not cognate words. Um, I'm going to tell you something else, which I'm sure you all realize before finally getting to something you don't realize, um, which is that there is a lot of nonsense on the internet. Okay? Uh, anyone in the world can look at words and languages like da and day and say, oh, oh those must be related. Um, you can look at words like the Chinese word for more, which is duo, and say, hey, that kind of looks like uh, duo in Latin, uh, more than one, duo. Um, and or a lot, uh, duo is uh, more than one. So uh, you could say those two languages are related. Um, no. Uh, so when you see something on the internet, uh, be careful. Uh, but you knew that already. OK, let's go back to our data. Um, up to this stage, I have raised a dead language. And to me, as a linguist, that's exciting, because I can now say the word for mother was pronounced something like mechter in uh, this Proto-Indo-European language. Others of you are looking at your watches um, because you don't care how they pronounce this. So let's go a little bit farther. Um, something else, once you've uh, developed the language uh, and figured out what words are in it, you can do figure out things about the people and their culture. Now, there are other ways of figuring out things about 
ancient people and cultures that uh, never wrote anything down. Uh, you can put on a pith helmet and get a shovel and go and dig up their graves and their pots and so on. Uh, that takes a lot of work and you'll get hot. Um, so <laughs> instead, uh, what you can do is you can look at language, you can go over to the library um, and look at the languages and it's uh, air conditioned in the summer in the library, which is nice on because most of our buildings here are not air conditioned in the summer. And you can figure out things like words that we can reconstruct for Proto-Indo-European. The word for copper. Uh, so they had copper. That's significant because it tells us something about when they lived. That is, um, not before the Copper Age. Uh, copper doesn't grow on trees, right? Uh, you've got to smelt it out of the ore. Um, and so if they had copper, then they're not Neolithic people. They're after that period. On the other hand, we can't reconstruct a word for iron. So uh, they had not yet uh, figured out iron working technology. So that sort of puts them uh, at a certain location in time. How about a location in space, okay? Uh, they have a word for snow, okay? So they probably didn't live in Singapore, right? Um, uh, and along with that, they don't have a word for palm tree. Okay, so uh, not in a tropical area, probably. Uh, snow, but no palm trees. Um, they had a word for goose, um, but no word for chicken. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Chico Marx, via goose, via no chicken. Um, well, because we know chickens were um, uh, originally domesticated in Southeast Asia, um, sometimes several millennia ago, but they didn't make their way west for some millennia after that. Um, so made their way to Greek and Roman culture probably in the early first millennium BC. Uh, so the Proto-Indo-Europeans lived in some place where chickens had not yet been uh, introduced. Um, but they did have other kinds of animals. Uh, they had cows um, and uh, they had sheep uh, and they have a word for wool also. So they used the sheep to make uh, wool naturally. Um, and they had a word for horse and a word for wheel. And these last two are particularly interesting because uh, we know that horses were domesticated somewhere in Central Asia or maybe Southeast Europe uh, sometime probably around uh, 6,000, 7,000 years ago. Um, and we also know um, that wheeled vehicles were invented not too long after that, maybe a millennium later. Originally, when they domesticated the horses, they probably ate them. Uh, but eventually, they figured out, oh, we can ride on them. And then someone figured out, hey, we can take these wheels and attach them to cows and uh, horses and get around faster. Um, this would be useful if, for example, you wanted to move somewhere. Any of you who have ever moved somewhere are probably glad that you had a wheeled vehicle in which to pile all your stuff instead of having to carry it around on your back. Um, so um, the Indo-Europeans, we know, moved a lot because wherever they lived originally, they weren't spread all the way from Ireland to India. They must have lived someplace, some smaller location, and then spread out from there, probably using their newly developed uh, wheel technology uh, uh, and riding around on horses also. Uh, those of you who've heard of the Indo-Europeans may know of an older theory that the Indo-Europeans went around uh, charging around in chariots, uh, conquering people, uh, which was a nice romantic story that's probably not true because chariots were not invented until later. So they had wheeled vehicles like carts. Um, they may have gone around conquering people. Uh, that's a shameful habit that many people have engaged in, but they weren't using chariots to do it. Um, crucially, all of this information put together helps us to locate the Indo-Europeans in time and space. Um, that's a, still a very controversial topic, um, but most linguists would agree, uh, some don't because academics love to argue about everything, but most would agree that probably somewhere in what is now Ukraine, uh, maybe Eastern Ukraine, um, and probably around 6,000 years ago is where and when we would locate the Proto-Indo-European speakers, speakers of this language. Okay, so we can in fact find out things about their culture, their material culture. Um, they had agriculture as well as stock breeding. Um, we can uh, find out all those things, but what else can we find out? Um, we can actually find out things about their non-material culture. We can reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European word, dios, meaning sky god. Um, so this is interesting. We know that the Indo-Europeans, and this seems to have been their chief god, worshipped a god of the bright sky. This is in fact related to a word meaning bright. Uh, so uh, the god of the bright sky, and this should be um, familiar to you if you think, well, you probably don't know Sanskrit, dios, but um, Greek, dzeus, where the dieu has turned into a dz, um, and now we pronounce it z, but it was dz in ancient Greek, Zeus, or Latin, although it's a little bit harder to tell, you, pater, where the pater means father, 
and the D um, uh, has turned into a J in Latin. So we have this father sky god uh, who was the chief god of the Proto-Indo-European people and he persisted into a lot of these cultures. Uh, you may be wondering about this point, um, what happened to this god in English? You don't see him around much anymore, right? Um, well, let's pause for a minute and say, if we had this god by name in English, um, his name ought to start with a T, right? If it's Proto-Indo-European D, then it should be English T. So you think of some English T, and Thor isn't going to work because that's spelled with a T, but it's not pronounced T, it's pronounced th. Um, so it's not Thor, but Thor does give me an idea. We do have some days of the week named for gods. Uh, today is Sunday, right? And then there's Moon Day tomorrow. And then uh, later in the week, we have Woden's Day, uh, or Odin. You might call him Wotan if you're a fa fan of Wagner, right? Um, and he's the chief god of the Germanic people, and obviously Thor's Day after that. But right in the middle of those days, what do we have? We have a day that starts with T. Woohoo! Tuesday. Now you know who T is. So this is something that you might not have realized, that uh, Tuesday is, in fact, the day dedicated to the god whose name is the same as Zeus and Jupiter and Diaush and a few other names in some other Indo-European languages. Um, you don't see Tiu around much anymore. Even in the Germanic period, he seems to have been supplanted by Woden, who was an upstart who launched a coup against him. Uh, Woden is a god of magic, and Tiu sort of got shoved into the background. Uh, so if you feel sad for Tiu, maybe you can uh, pour out a libation to him on uh, Tuesday this week or something. <laughs> uh, so that's the, uh, what we can reconstruct for Proto-Indo-European culture. Um, I have focused on Proto-Indo-European because that's what I know the most about, but some of you might be saying, well, what about other language families of the world? Well, there are some. There's Indo-European, obviously Semitic languages like, um, uh, like Arabic, um, Hebrew, um, ancient Akkadian, ancient and modern Aramaic. Um, there's the Sino-Tibetan languages, which includes Chinese and Tibetan, and also Burmese, and also about 200 other languages. Um, and for any of these language families, we can reconstruct the ancestral form and learn something about the people and their culture, where and when they lived, and what gods they worshipped, and what they ate, and so on, uh, all without having to go out into the field and dig up uh, people's graves. Um, uh, Austronesian includes languages ranging all the way from Madagascar over to Hawaii, so the Polynesian languages, languages of Indonesia, um, Niger-Congo languages of sub-Saharan Africa, including Swahili and other Bantu languages, languages of Nigeria. Uh, Algonquian languages, which were spoken right here at one time in the past uh, in this part of the country uh, before white people came. Uh, Iroquoian languages uh, still spoken um, in uh, not too far away from here, and many others. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, learning more about the prehistory of the world, you can do it using linguistics. Uh, you can uh, research and find out uh, what cultures were like thousands of years ago just by looking at their languages. Um, if you're not interested in that, then I hope you and your birds defeated the pigs.